Hello, everybody, and welcome to Learn with the Expert. We're excited to have you here today. As we are waiting for everyone to join us, we will love to have you introduce yourself in the chat. Um, so in the chat, please share where you're from, what your role is, um, what your grade level is. The chat is on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you don't see it, look at the bottom right corner for the little chat icon and just tap on it to open it up and introduce yourself. Today, we're excited to meet an expert in the field of education, Dee Lanier, who will share how to design educational experiences involving arts, problem solving, and gaming to make learning engaging, equitable, and accessible for all of our students. Hello, Christopher, welcome. Hi, Erica, hello, welcome, welcome. Make sure you're dropping in where you're from, what your role in is. Hi, Teresa. Hello, Carrie. Welcome, welcome. Hello, Andreas from Thailand. That's amazing. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everybody. All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. We have a few housekeeping items before we go ahead and get to the meat and the potatoes. So if you have any questions during the session that you would like Dee to answer, um, please click on the Q&A tab and ask them there. This just ensures that we don't miss anything. And if there are any questions that go unanswered, we'll reach out to you directly after the webinar to answer those questions. That Q&A tab is located right next to the chat uh, tab. All other comments, reactions, ideas, thoughts can be put in the chat tab so that all participants can view them. Um, make sure if you are just joining us that the chat and Q&A tabs are open. If they're not, click on that little chat icon in the lower right hand corner and you will have the option to click between the chat and Q&A. And you'll also notice that there is a handout tab, which we will include um, any links as well in resources from today's session. Um, key takeaways. This session is being recorded and a link to the recording as well as the handouts or the links from today's webinar, excuse me, will be shared uh, with you in an email following about 24 to 48 uh, hours after uh, this session ends. Hi, Jen from San Diego. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Salma, welcome. All right, you all have been introducing yourselves in the chat, so you're probably wondering who we are. My name is Mia. I am the Training and Professional Development Specialist here at Seesaw. So I train administrators and educators like yourselves on different innovative ways to integrate Seesaw into uh, your school community or your classroom. I am based in Chicago, Illinois, Chi-Town, Southside, born and raised. Um, and I am happy to introduce our expert. So we have today with us Dee Lanier, who is a good friend of mine and a respected educator. And he is here to show you how to design learning experiences that support multimodal student expression. D is the author of Demarginalizing Design and a passionate and energetic educator and learner with over two decades of instructional experience um, in the K through 12 space. D has facilitated racial equity and culturally responsive professional development globally through the lens of design thinking. D holds an undergraduate and master's degree in sociology with special interest in education, race relations, and inequity. D is also the creator of Design Thinking Educational Activities Solve in Time and Maker Kitchen, and is the co host of the Liberated Educator podcast. He's done it all, folks. So, welcome, D. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, goodness. Thank you so much, Mia. It's always uh, fun and a little bit embarrassing to be introduced by a friend, especially. It's like, really? You're going to read all that? Okay. Thank you. Thanks for all of that. <laughs> well, it is absolutely right. It is so good uh, to be here with you all and my Seesaw family and all of these educators literally from across the globe. So that is fantastic to see you all. Um, you can maybe see from behind me, I have a little picture here. So I live in North Carolina. I'm from Los Angeles and never get it twisted. If you ask me where I'm from, I'm always going to say um, from Los Angeles, California, because that's where my formative years uh, happened. And But 
we are about to jump into this topic of design teaching. And you might be asking yourself the question, well, what exactly is that? Well, we'll dive into that. Um, so if that becomes one of your questions, um, you can hold off on that one. If you are asking yourself, what is design teaching? Definitely going to define that. But other questions that come up throughout this uh, particular presentation, reminder, there is a Q&A tab. I'm looking forward to sharing and also responding to uh, whatever comes up as part of our time. <clears throat> first things first, I got to get kind of warmed up. I got to get my water. And I got to hope that I can get a little bit of heightness going on because I would love to be with you all in person, uh, but I'm not here with you in person, but we are here virtually, right? So virtually, I got to hear from some of you all. Um, I believe that we have here in this building, uh, in this building, in this virtual building, in these buildings, in these spaces, we have designers. And I want to welcome you. If you are uh, in any role capacity in education, if you are a classroom teacher, if you are an administrator, if you are a counselor, uh, if you are a custodian, whatever your role, your position, if you are a coach, you are a designer of experiences for others. And in that, that then also qualifies you as an artist because you are a designer, you are an artist, and I am very privileged to be with you right now. So thank you again for being here, and I'm looking forward to diving in. So let's go ahead and do that. And if we have any kind of technical difficulties, y'all know how it goes. We all have survived the pandemic and um, survived attempting to teach during the pandemic. So tech stuff happens and we keep it moving. I'm still seeing people coming in. I'm so excited uh, to see you all coming in here. So this concept of design teaching is a mashup, if you didn't notice, because I just saw, I got to give a, a shout out to Samuel Berry, who just said, you know, founder and executive director of the Design Ed Thinking School. So um, if you are familiar with this concept of design thinking, and don't worry, we won't dive too deep in it. Just know that it is thinking like a designer. But if you are in some way, shape, or form familiar with the concept of design thinking, well, this is a mashup of that perspective along with what we are all very familiar with, and that is teaching. So design teaching is what we want to be about. And um, maybe, so just maybe, again, this is not uh, to bore anyone or this is not going to, there's not going to be a test at the end of this. But if you are familiar with a form of design thinking, notice I'm saying A and not the, uh, if you're familiar with a model of design thinking, this might be one that you have become familiar with. It was the ideal model established in 1978. And it looks like this. Uh, so you see everything from discovery uh, to evolution. The thing to notice is, is that it is a five-step process. I just want you to hold on to that reality. Five-step process of going from a starting place to an ending place. There is the D school model that was established in 2005. Here's something else to notice as I give you these dates. These are fairly recent. Uh, so the D school uh, established uh, this concept and, and this model in 2005. And this is the one that's probably most familiar to many educators because it was established within an educational setting at Stanford School, so uh, Stanford University. So it looks like this, and it means empathize, go into tests, and again, we see a five-step process. Familiar, right? Uh, starting to look familiar. And then there's another process, and, and I'm, I'm not going to give you all of the processes that exist and all of the different uh different models that exist because we would be here all day. And I'm not even going in depth in these. I am just trying to help you understand that there are multiple models and they have things in common and they are a, a systematic step-by-step -step process from a starting place to an ending place. And it really starts with problem solving or its whole perspective is, is around problem solving. And uh, here is another one, the liberatory design uh, model, which was developed in 2016. A few folks that uh, were familiar with the D school model said, you know what, this needs to uh, center on equity because it does not in its current iteration. And so there needs to be a stop 
stopping and pausing at every step of the process to both notice and reflect what are your biases in these processes. And so absolutely love it. That's liberatory design. And um, I happen to have also created or co-designed, if you will, with teachers and with students and my own children, another model called Solve in Time, which is a gamified design thinking process. Okay, <sighs> breathe. Because I just gave you a bunch of stuff that you might say, what's the relevance and why should I care? And I just want to highlight again, there are multiple models of design thinking. So if you've ever heard the design thinking model is, I would say, uh, take a look. You can pull out your phones. You can do some Google searching. You can see 10 others. Easy. There are multiple models, uh, but they have some things in common. And they are step-by-step -step processes to go from a starting place to an ending place that has a result that is supposed to help others, right? Uh, and so you see my five-step process plus an SOS card, which I'll share a little bit more uh, later. But I just want to say I really love the liberatory design process, and it really uh, formed something in me. And that was to consider the place of equity in all of these conversations, because depending on what model you use or choose to use or have been familiarized uh, with, that there's this like internal argument or debate, I should say, within design thinking uh, schools of thought. And that is, uh, should you start with, with empathy? And then, well, what is empathy? And then who are those people? And then how do we do that? And I would argue that we must start with equity because if you start with empathy, you might miss equity. But if you start with equity, you will get empathy every time. All right. This is just a concept that's in my book and demarginalizing design. And, and, and this is a concept that is still a work in process and it is a mindset. And that's what design thinking is first and foremost. And it is a iterative design making process, a deliberate decision to start and end with equity, which ensures empathy. OK, I feel like I'm taking everybody to school real, real quick. Uh, but I love this language by Chan Ye. He just makes it really, really simple. Uh, if I was uh, presenting to a group of middle schoolers, this is the language that they would be most comfortable with because design is systematized problem solving. Hmm, break that down. It says, hey, this thing right here, it sucks. And I have a couple of uh, ideas of how to make it better. So if you're like, OK, all of those different models, and I feel like I could do some homework and you didn't get in, into any of that. Uh, just know that design thinking is looking at something, seeing that it's problematic and then wanting to do something about it in, in order to make it different. All right. So that is what uh, design thinking is. And then if we add the concepts of the mindset of what design thinking is to teaching, I think we can do some magical things in the classroom. I really, really, really do. All right. Let you know a little bit about my family before we continue on. This is a picture of my four children. So yes, I have four kids and uh, because I am presenting here from home and um, just like within the pandemic, we are always used to uh, ambient noise. You might hear them in the background because they will make a special appearance because in the East Coast it is uh, past dinner time already. So, you know, things are happening here, but here's a picture of the four kids and when I was growing up, I don't know about you, and you can add something in the chat if you want to. As a matter of fact, I'll just do this as a simple call and response just to see if people are hearing me and if you are still here with me. So when I was growing up, we would have Saturday morning, put it in the chat if you want to complete that. Saturday morning, what happens on Saturday mornings when we were kids? Cartoons, here they go. <laughs> right? Somebody said blueberry pancakes. I like it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it's so a chore time. Yeah. And maybe cartoons after the chores. Sports. Yeah, yep. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Well, it's so crazy, right? Because we now live in an era where uh, Saturday morning cartoons is like, okay. Uh, but starting with my kids uh, when they were young, we would we'd give uh, Saturday morning as device day. Like we let them binge out. They can look at any and every screen that exists. Um, and that is like their Saturday morning cartoons after 
of course, some cleaning up and things like that. Uh, but Saturday is the day we let everyone just kind of binge and hang out. And so this is that picture of my four kids all with their own individual device, which is crazy in and of itself, if you consider that. Um, but speaking of some things that are crazy in and of itself, this is my oldest daughter. Her name is Karis. This is her with a VR headset on. This is Google Cardboard. Y'all familiar with that. And not only is she like in VR, but she is also navigating a museum in Italy. So she's going, you know, across the globe and in a very exclusive environment. But then we also try to open it up so that her siblings could see what she was seeing. And that's why you see the casting of what is in her uh, in, in, in on her phone in this VR headset on the television. Right. And trying to open up that opportunity for them. And what's wild is the fact that this picture is so old. I'm going to show you how old this picture is. This is how old that picture is. Because this is Karis today. Uh, Karis is about to turn 16. Karis just bought her own car. And I bring all that up to say it's amazing because some of the th things that I just showed you with the VR headset and the mirror casting to the television, those are all examples of technology we're still trying to figure out its place in education today. All right. So speaking about technology, I am curious um, or I just want to share a few things just to let you know. This was my first robot. This was my first drone. Uh, this was my introduction to technology and robotics. And you think about some of the things that our kids uh, are engaged in and uh, and what they have the opportunity to really explore this is crazy because technology has changed the game so much, right? Uh, this was my first video game system. It's called the ColecoVision. And uh, my favorite video game on ColecoVision was Donkey Kong, by the way. This was my first computer. I don't know what your first computer was, but this was my first computer, Commodore 64. So I don't know if you were Team Amber or Team Green, but with the Commodore 64, you could plug it up to your television, and this was my computer. <laughs> Texas Instrument. I'm seeing the people putting the shout outs to their uh, devices and technology. Oh yeah, I see you, Carrie. All right, quiz. Who happens to know not what this is called, because I think we all know that this is called a floppy disk, but how much storage is on this floppy disk? The trash 80, Jimmy says. Use the, mm, oh, wow, 15 gig would be a lot. <laughs> it was really interesting to see if anybody Googled it, but I love it that you guys are trying to be honest and guess it. Don't remember. All right. So 512 kilobytes, 512 kilobytes, which just to put that in perspective, this picture, if exported, would not fit on that disc, which is nuts. All right share a couple of other things about me. <clears throat> so um, all of my things in my house are um, automated. I'm not going to even say the, hey, that word that starts with a G because it'll hear me and it'll start responding to this stuff. These lights uh, are smart lights. Most This is actually like my whole house is, is smart enabled. And it's sort of a problem that I have because uh, when it comes down to it, I wish I was Tony Stark. It's what I kind of want to be. I want to be able to just speak to things and things happen. Um, but sometimes technology can be a little bit problematic. So, for instance, with my Google Home, one day I asked it to just do me a favor and put something on my calendar. It was a simple request. 
I said, hey, tomorrow we have a staff meeting at 430. Can you make sure that you remind me by putting it on my calendar? It said, sure, I got you. Uh, and it did that. But what I did not notice is the fact that it put in something completely different than I expected. And by the way, that was a double fail. And it made me think, why do we put up with this? Why do we invest in technology when we know that it's going to fail us? Uh, and I just kind of think that sometimes it's, it's the promise of what it will be or what it can be. And we've kind of bought into this thought that over time, this technology is going to get better and it's going to serve me well. Now, consider that same mindset as it pertains to teaching and learning. I'm going to show something that's actually incredibly embarrassing and uh, not sure exactly if our audio will work. And that is not what is most necessary. I just want you to visually see with your eyes what's happening in my old classroom. This was like my second or third year teaching. And I dug up this video off the archives and just made some observations of some things that could be improved. And you can type in in the chat things that you recognize from this video that could be improved from a newer or younger teacher. What's the next word? Stop being difficult. What word did you have down? What word is that? A facsimile. Anybody know what a facsimile machine is? Anybody heard of a fax machine? That's all facsimile is. Fax is short for facsimile. Okay? So when you read that word, everybody knows what it is, right? A fax machine. So the world has been made smaller through technology, through such things as computers and... She's dead asleep, by the way. Got it. Oh, okay. Give it to me. I'm, I'm, I'm go ahead. Go, go ahead and tell Mr. Lanier some things that need to be improved in his classroom. And you can put it in the chat. And it's helpful for us to recognize the problems before we try and solve any of them. Karen just said, bless your heart. Yeah, that's very clear. Not engaged. I had a couple sleepers. Literally. Visuals. Yep. Engagement. Empty walls. Uncomfortable desk. Oh, my gosh. Yep. <laughs> yep. Asking more challenging open questions. Not only yes or no. Yes. Students aren't working together. Excellent. Yeah, you guys are even just checking the environment. Kids are, <laughs> yep. Kids are not color. No, I couldn't. Uh, the class setup. Oh, I love it. Oh, you you all. So you all are actually giving us the goods on uh, some things that could be improved. No discussion, teacher center. No wait time in the question. Yep. Hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Well, thank you. Thank you for all of those things. I wish I had you as my coaches uh, because I had no coach. I was a lateral entry teacher attempting to do something that I didn't know how to do well. And you want to know what it kind of came down to? I actually just replicated the same exact experience I had as a student. And so I thought I was doing the right thing. As a matter of fact, my principal would oftentimes stand at my door and say, Miss Lanier, you're doing what you're supposed to do. It's just these kids. And I ain't paint the picture to let you know that these kids, these kids that became um, some of my, just my heart, but these kids were kids that were discarded, kids that were told that they uh, won't do much or be much. This was an alternative high school. And for many of my students, this was their last stop. Uh, and some of my students, this was their 
court order or else uh, environment. Yeah, uh, you know it's a fact. So, yeah, and then uh, the worst part about the facsimile is, is like, who cares? Uh, it wasn't relevant to them. Okay, question. This is a real question. The question is, is when you see this next video, do you recognize any growth in me as a teacher? And literally, uh, just a, a year or two later, uh, matter of fact, I, I think I looked at the timestamp. This was about two years later. I started making changes in my classroom, just attempting to do something different. So I'm going to play this video real quick for you and see if you see any observations of growth in me, not perfection, but growth in my teaching. Y'all focus. This is Nima Ma. <laughs> well, you don't even have to put them together yet. You'll regather them all. Put them together. Look, man, they ain't got nothing to do. Y'all don't have any more questions for them? Everybody's done? What about that one? Is she done? Miss Adams, are you done? Are you done with your questions? Hey. Here's my suggestion. Ask Miss Adams which question she has left, and uh, you can take one, one or two of hers. Because you compile them tomorrow. How's it coming, y'all? Hello. Y'all working hard? Yeah, you guys will compile them tomorrow. Hey, FYI, we got about four more minutes. Good job, you guys. Working hard. Keep working together. All right, so um, hopefully you saw some group, some growth in me, and I'm seeing what some of you are are saying and recognizing. Some of it has to do with just grouping. Um, I had a smart board. You want to know what I use it for? I use it for displaying a giant timer so that people could see how much time we had left before we moved on to the next thing. We were actually doing test prep during this time, and because test prep was something that was mandated to us. Uh, or taking standardized tests and said, okay, I can fight this or we can do something with it. And so what you don't know what's happening here is that they were actually creating review cards for a review game that they were going to develop. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I, I love uh, you highlighting some of the things that I think I was getting better over time. And here's the thing, good design achieves its intended outcome. So if my intended outcome was engagement, I wasn't getting it, then I needed to recognize it wasn't the students, it was actually the design. And I was the designer, so I had to do something different. And just to let you know, when things really changed for me and when things really turned around for me is when I just stopped. When I just completely stopped doing what I used to do or how I started out doing things. Because, like I told you, I was a lateral entry teacher. I was getting some minor coaching from others. I was really, really making observations of some of my colleagues. And I was also given a first aid kit. Some of you may have been given the same first aid kit. You let me know. Y'all know Harry Wong? <laughs> right? I was given the first days of school, and I would... Um, I would try and meet my students outside of the classroom before they came in, and I'd try and like look them in the face and smile at them and shake their hand or put a, a hand on their shoulder. And most of my students would be like, get off me. Why are you always so happy and talking to me? Like they would like give me a little bit of pushback on stuff like that. I tried to have my word wall, right? Maybe you saw in my previous video, it had fallen down. And I, I tried to have my instructions clearly stated. I tried to, I tried to, I tried to, I tried to do a lot of things that I was told that were correct. I had my standards, my objectives, my essential questions on the board, and students would quietly come into class and fall asleep, right? Because I would ask myself the question over time, essential questions, essential to who, right? Essential to who? Um, later, I started instead of putting my essential questions and standards and objectives on the board, I would have those things on my person and then after class start asking the students questions to see if they caught 
what I was after. And if the answer was no, then I realized I needed to reteach it or I needed to change what was on my paperwork because the objectives were actually being uh, defined by the students based on what our content was. But so often I've, I've walked into dozens, if not hundreds of classrooms, especially as an ed tech coach across the country, uh, doing work with Google in the past. And one of the schools that I walked in, I noticed on every single wall, they had objectives at the door of every classroom. And I read these and I just kind of, so I started asking questions. I'm like, what are those? And I'm like, oh, they are our state uh, standards. And I'm like, why are they here? And they're like, because the students are supposed to see what they are going to do before they walk into the classroom. I said, interesting. Let me ask you, and you could put it in the chat. When you read this, what class do you think this is? And what grade level do you think it is? That is correct. It is an art class. High school art. Huh. Ninth grade art, maybe the 9.1. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, right? Can be digital art. Art year 10. Let me show you. This is that class. Fourth graders. It was fourth graders. It was a fourth grade art class. And when I took those objectives and I ran it through a readability report in order to see what grade level were those objectives written on, you see that it is college grad level. So it's wild because something that was supposed to help the students know what they're doing that, that day, they can't even read it, let alone get excited about it. And the craziest thing is this is what they were doing that day. They were doing spin art. It just made me think, what are we doing here? It was spin art. All right, so it just makes me start to think, okay, well, why must we do something different? Why must we do something different? And here is a big why. Here's a research in a nutshell, because it is literally neurobiologically impossible to think deeply about things you don't care about. Facts. So when we don't center on what students care about, or at least pull in their interests first, then we discard their interests from the very beginning. And we know that they actually cannot learn as a result of that. It made me think a lot about what we do in education and how we have neurobiological research that backs up some of the things that we put into practice and also disproves some other things that we put in practice. And it made me think as a whole, we tend to center on the left side of the brain, critical thinking and communication as most important. And unfortunately, we don't engage the other side of the brain, which is creativity and collaboration. As a matter of fact, we're rewarded by critical thinking and communication, especially as it pertains to standardized tests and achievements there. And we are punished in different ways as it pertains to creativity. And if you question that, let me show you something and then ask you a question. So here is some research that I found a few years back, and it was really centering on the importance of computer science and engineering. And so you can see that that's why that is highlighted. But when you see at the very top, the two subject areas that students like a lot, what they like a lot, they like 
art and design. They like performing arts. You see here, they like computer science and engineering. And then you see what they don't like a lot. Sorry, math teachers. But here's the real question. If a school is underperforming, what are the things that we take away? We take away the very things that they like a lot. We got to do something different. Yes, I believe that we can integrate art with technology, uh, and that is for sure. So some of the things I started considering was, how do I get back to this from my childhood? Right? How do I create memories over memorization? Yes, that is a picture of me. <laughs> That's not just an Instagram filter and me wearing some clothes from Old Navy. That's me when I was like eight years old in San Diego, California. And it was funny. I was going through some pictures uh, in Google Photos and I found this picture and I was like, huh, that's hilarious because I tend to give this face a lot. And I can tell you the story behind this picture. Matter of fact, it was when I was doing a presentation and afterwards a couple of documentary documentarians, uh, however you say that word, came up to me and asked, can we interview you? And I said, absolutely. And so I took this picture. Uh, I happened to be at a different event and we had a great time. And I had this picture and I started noticing that my photo album is full of these sort of pictures of me giving that funny face. Uh, whenever I'm excited about something, when I'm surprised about something, I can tell you the stories behind every single one of these pictures. And the late, great Dr. Maya Angelou says this, that I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So we have to work hard at making sure that we make our students feel and feel like they are welcome in their spaces feel like they are loved and cared for, feel that we care about who they are, what they're interested in, and we connect with who they are and what they're connected with, what they uh, are interested in to what our content is, right? So how? This might be the burning question. This is the burning question. So how do we do this? First of all, know this, good tech can't fix poor pedagogy. It just can't. So slapping a bunch of technology on it doesn't do it. But we can do some things and technology can be a part of it, but it can also start very low tech. So remember when I told you that my students in that second video were actually creating a review game? Well, we collaborated together and we made our own review game rules. And so it eventually turned into like a monopoly slash life game that we put together. And they were studying the same key terms from the same outdated, boring book and learning things like facsimile and what they were used for and when and why. But they were able to do that and they and we gamified what that learning looked like. And they actually had some fun. You can go a little bit more techy with it and maybe check out a resource like flippity.net if you're unfamiliar in order to take uh, spreadsheets and turn them into different activities. One of the things I did with my students was I had have them create their own review games. I shared that earlier, but then they would create their own rules to their different review games in groups. And then we would have our small groups go around and rate each other's games. Well, what was happening? They were actually reviewing the content multiple times over as they were reviewing each other's games. Eventually, that turned into um, a group of third graders and fourth graders and I creating this activity called Smashboard EDU, sort of a hyperdocs mashup with um, app smashing and we started creating games together. Again, we were always centering on our content, but we were gamifying the process by making it fun together, utilizing technology in many cases. And that uh, Smashboard EDU eventually turned into a card activity 
that started, uh, that was actually published and was distributed uh, to many schools across the country. And then I went back to one of my other old schools, the second school that I worked at, actually the third school that I worked at, uh, that helped me design Smashboard EDU. And they helped me co-design some new activities using new materials. And next thing you know, we were creating a design thinking activity called Solve in Time. And that is an activity I call myself the co-designer of because it was co-designed with students uh, starting again in third grade through sixth grade and my own children and other teachers across the country. And it just, it just turned into something that was special for me. And that was engaging my audience, being students primarily, and asking them to help me create their learning experience and us making it fun. So some of you were calling out the early uh, Mr. D. Lanier because of my classroom setup, and I could not agree with you more. As a matter of fact, I oftentimes say that I can tell more about your pedagogy than anything just based on what your classroom setup is. And so here's me walking into a classroom and seeing this classroom setup and saying, I bet you I know what this class feels like because I can see it in the setup itself. Then I walked into a different classroom in the same building and it looked like this. And I was like, whoa, this seems like a space that I would like to be in, right? I can see what the values are of the teacher, not only by the decorations and the bright colors uh, and the just the fantastic ambiance, but also just how the tables are set up. Right. Then I walked into another classroom and I was blown away. Matter of fact, I'm playing the music or the audio here because this is what it sounded like when I walked in there. This is so awesome. And it just made me think I know that that teacher has no classroom management issues because she set up her entire ambiance to make it feel like a comfortable, warm, and inviting space. And in my last uh, classroom experience, when my students came in the first day of class, this is what our room looked like. And most of my other teachers looked at me like, what are you doing? Like, why aren't you de decorating your room? And I said, because this is not my space. And the people who will be in the space for learning haven't come yet, and they haven't design this space for their learning yet. And so we decided to co-design that space. And I just promised to not touch it until the residents of it were there in order to inform what it should look like, feel like, what decoration should be there, what things should happen in that space. Before moving on, can we just agree that technology can be very disruptive? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> the most disruptive tech in any class is the loudspeaker. But sort of real talk and going back to the idea of the fact that we can create learning environments and they don't necessitate, um, you know, big tech. I started blowing my high school students' minds when I came into class and said, no more lined paper, no more regular pen and pencil. We're using blank white sheets of paper. It'll be in landscape mode. And I need everyone to pick your four favorite colors of color pencils. And just as predicted, students started asking, what is this, kindergarten? And I was teaching high school business. And I said, yes. And I asked the question, what do you remember about kindergarten? And the kids started saying stuff like, yeah, it was kind of fun. Tell me, what made it fun? I mean, you know, you got to color all day. Okay, you like color. Uh, you know, we got to sing songs. You got Oh, so you got to do things that involved uh, color and music and movement. You got to go outside. Huh. We're going to do all those things in our classroom. And started doing that in high school started uh, creating maker spaces with very, very low cost materials. We later were able to get a donation for a 3D printer 
but we didn't need that originally. This is actually not a picture of my uh, classroom, but we had a classroom like it where we created maker kitchens, just places with maker materials that can be utilized. Whenever we were short on resources, we made a game of it. So for instance, uh, the Chromebooks all needed to be used for a different grade level for map testing. And so we had two computers in our class this one particular day. And so we made a game of research and said that we're going to have a silent research day. And uh, we had two students at the computer and everyone else had to write them notes and ask them questions and they had to respond to things and it was completely silent. We made a game out of it. I didn't know if it was gonna work, but we tried. And it did work, surprisingly. Started gamifying other things. Anything that wasn't working, we started to say, how do we make it work? And design thinking says, we're going to attempt something and we're going to go through the iterative steps that are necessary in order to achieve the intended outcome. So, for instance, y'all know the ask three before me rule, the whole uh, don't ask me a question until you've asked three others. And it did not matter how often I said that. It did not matter if I had a poster on the wall. It didn't matter if I literally had a sign on my chest that said ask three before me. Hands would always shoot up whenever there was a question. I'd say, have you asked three before me? And they say, but you're the teacher. And so then I decided to gamify it. This is part of solving time cards. Uh, but I started giving my small groups one of these cards. So small group of three or four have one card. And on the back of this card, it says exactly as you see here. You can ask someone else. You can refer to other resources. You can search online. But if you have done those three things and you are still stuck, you can raise this card. I will come over and then I will help you. And I'll take your card. So use it wisely. It's amazing how independent the students could be and how interdependent on one another they could become once they realize the rules of the game are is that you must collaborate. Change just a ton of what I did. I'm going to skip past a couple of other things because I have too many stories. I have too many stories. But I want to let you know that I started to create new goals, new goals in my classroom. And so my standards, and as I would write notes to myself before putting anything on the board, as I would say, my standard for today is I need to design an experience that and I would do the hard work of trying to consider how do I take this thing that looks boring even on paper for me to read and I have to translate it to something that the students would be interested in. And I'd say if I started with I'm designing an experience, what would this experience be? That's my standard. And then if I were to consider what's my objective, I want to make students curious. Based on what we're looking at today, what do I want to make them curious about? And then lastly, my essential question, what relevant real world problems might they solve by learning this content? You see, Paulo Fuere, who's a hero of mine, said that the teacher is no longer merely the one who teaches, but the one he is himself or or herself taught in dialogue with students. And so when I would set my goals, if they failed, then that became a learning opportunity for me with my students to figure out how do we make this a better experience for you? And then also how do we iterate what has happened in this classroom space so that the next people that experience it have a better experience than you did? See what I'm saying? And started doing lots of other things. Again, don't even have time to get into. But one of the things I gamified as well with solving time, but was utilizing in multiple ways even beyond that or before that was to say, you know what? I'm going to stop requiring that everything is a multiple choice test or a written essay. But instead, what would it look like if students can share their learning in various ways? 
such as a poster uh, or a sketch or maybe a song or a speech or maybe a skit or a play or maybe even a story or a poem. How do we bring in their creativity and how can I be blown away as an educator based on what they do? And just in case you were curious, I got a lot of those ideas from Seesaw because it's what we do. When I say what we do, it's a uh, great artist steal. <laughs> so wrapping things up, letting you know, I just became curious. And when you're curious and you start to consider the fact that I already know based on the research that students enjoy and love art. And so I cannot take that away from them, but instead I must integrate it. And so what might it look like to bring art into math? It's so unfortunate that in many schools across the country, we've taken it away. But how might I bring art to history? Wait a minute. Hasn't that been done? What might it look like to bring art to science? So this is super cool. Check this out. The DNA is such an unwind. The RNA is the other side. Myosis is the key to make you lie. My toast is coffee, so the bugs will die. If my jeans don't let them rest, all my souls are dead. If my jeans don't let them rest, all my souls are dead. If my jeans don't let them rest, all my souls are dead. If my jeans don't let them rest, a blast of DNA. Pepper-mycosis happens in the interface. Then we move to prophase. Strings will start to shake. Call the kiss and kiss as the bubble breaks down. Yeah, I'm talking then break. Let a face from his feet of the heart. And a face from his arm for the bark. To the face, only your memory will start. While the cell starts to get like a part. Cytokinesis is the cycle. That's when cytoplasm is split up into. My else is alive. Something happens twice. Something happens twice. Ah, it's amazing. Sometimes when you just bring out, when you just give the opportunity for students to use their artistic talent and say, whatever you would like to do, I want you to do it with this and see what they create. They will blow you away. They will learn and you will as well. I leave you with this. Assigners, which is what I definitely was, they create the conditions for critique, but designers create the conditions for creativity. And so I invite you all to be designers for many of you to continue in the hard work and the work that oftentimes is not looked upon uh, with lots of accolade or uh, given much applause from even your administrators. And I just want to remind you that you're doing the great work and I applaud you for it and thank you very much. And that is our time. Because it's more than just the rhythm, it's what Easter egg you want the drum to make. So sometimes, like, depending on the drum, it's Excuse me, interruption, Ms. Snyder, please call the main office. Ms. Snyder, please call the main office. <sighs> Had to put that one in there. <laughs> Interruptions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dee. Uh, that was amazing. I love that idea of making memories over memorization. Um, and they will remember those memories. Um, I just want to make sure everyone knows how to get in contact with you. If you want to learn more from Dee and stay connected, you can find him on Twitter. Um, and there is his Twitter handle at Dee Lanier. Um, also, uh, to access free amazing resources that he has and to support you in designing these experiences and innovative educational learning experiences, make sure you visit his website, um, which is solventime.com. We will be dropping a link to that site in the chat and it is also linked in the handouts tab as well. Um, and we will also include it in the follow-up email with the recording that you will receive in about 24 to 48 hours after the session is complete. Um, 
I want to thank you again, Dee, for joining us. Um, and we would love to take some time to answer some questions that our participants have. All right. So our first question is, how to teach design um, in elementary school? So um, Anila would like to explore and implement um, ways to do that in elementary or in those earlier grades. Excellent. I'm I'm very grateful for this question. So this is going to sound like a shameless plug because uh, it is with solving time. Uh, and I told you that it was it was designed uh, originally with third and fourth graders. And uh, I would say that when I first started trying to introduce design thinking, the concepts into um, into class and with those younger learners, I found myself explaining more about the process and defining terms than doing what the process was supposed to be intended for, which is problem solving and coming up with solutions, right? And so I found myself like trying to help them understand uh, words and concepts like ideation instead of just giving them the opportunity to come up with ideas, right? And so I started changing my language uh, and some of that process, like I said, uh, was gamified. So if you would like to introduce design or design thinking, if, if that is uh, most relevant to that question, Solve in Time is a resource that was developed for you in that regard. Um, and design broadly is so multifaceted and there's so many different forms of design. I know I don't know if I'm uh, giving that question enough justice there, but if you're thinking about design thinking, it, it's also on written all the words in the Solve in Time um, card set that you can either purchase or download for free on the website or on a second grade reading level. Great, thank you. All right, here's our next question from Kyle, especially related to you as a um, lateral entry teacher. We have a large number of untrained and experienced teachers at our school. What are the best ways to introduce, implement, and support design thinking with veteran and rookie teachers? Yep, all right, shameless plug again, <laughs> opportunity. Um, you know, we all we all have our biases, so we we kind of speak them out loud. But uh, I I could give I could give shout outs to to other things like mock up cards if you're familiar with them. Um, but having mixed groups, having small groups that is a mixture of those veteran teachers and some of those lesser experienced teachers, and having them work and collaborate together. The great thing is is that both of those, if I'm speaking them all about them sort of on, on uh, different ends of the spectrum have a lot to bring to the table, right? You have the veteran teachers that understand the environment, also understand classroom management, also understand the content, right? They, they, they bring a lot of wisdom and knowledge uh, to the table, but they also could be sort of just tired and kind of shrug their shoulders to what is same old, same old. And, and some of the newer teachers can come in and have just like really off the wall ideas. And so them coming together and collaborating together can um, oftentimes just make some magical things happen. And so I, th I think grouping them in mixed groups and then doing an activity together that is requesting of them to come up with solutions as a team and showcasing and sharing them. So design thinking, uh, or a design thinking process that can be utilized for that is is the solving time. Um, there are other activities that exist that are design thinking activities, but I would get them collaborating, working together, and sharing out as a team, and really seeing how rapport is built as well through that. Great. Thank you. So this will be our last question. Any questions that we don't get to, we'll make sure that we follow up with you one on one via email. This is from Derek. How do you create a plan with design thinking? Is it different than a lesson plan that teachers would typically use? Um, so, you know, I'm seeing how do I create a plan with design teaching? So, uh, first of all, that mashup of concepts of design thinking and teaching. I think I told you, like I started, it, it becomes the harder question because there's nothing that is standardized that is expected of me from the top down that's going to 
it emphasized creativity and uh, cultural responsiveness and interest-based learning. It's not going to do that. Um, so that work becomes mine and maybe a cohort of others. So that's why I utilize that language of uh, designing experiences that making students curious about and then asking what real and relevant problems might they solve through this content. So um, that becomes my aim and that becomes the harder work because that's tough to do. It's an iterative process. And when I say iterative, it means oftentimes trying something and then asking your students afterwards. I literally would do this. How did that go? Like recognizing I'm always on trial. Hey, we try, I tried a couple activities today. How did it go? And they would tell me and they'd be like, oh, I would change this up. Like it's, it's creating a learning community with your students. Um, and the cool thing is you're always still teaching them, instructing them, but they're also feeling like there is real trust in this space and, and it's a reciprocal relationship. And so you're asking for them to help change up what some of those experiences were to make them better, not only for them, if you were to try that again, but for future class periods. Uh, so oftentimes what ended up happening with me is, because uh, I taught with uh, in my first school four blocks, first block, whatever happened um, would, would sometimes fall on its face. Right. But they would they knew what I was doing, which was trying to transform what the standard lessons were. And so then they would start giving ideas and then I would come to the second block and tell them, hey, first block had some ideas and we tried this and da, 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 and then they get feedback. And so they were co-designing what our activities and our experience were. And then by four o'clock, I'd be like, hey, the last few blocks have done this. They've, they've already co-signed on it. They said this is going to be great. We're going to do it. And then you evaluate it. And then so it'd be like, this is like kid tested, teacher approved. At the end of it, I can book it and say, I got a lesson that I know is fire because these kids made it. <laughs> I know that this one is a hit. And then occasionally I find myself uh, surprised because I think I know this one is great. And then I try that activity with a new set of kids and it falls flat on its face. I'm like, what happened? Different kids, <laughs> right? <laughs> Different environment. So then we start iterating some more like, hey, what happened there? What do you guys think? So how creating a learning community, I think, is how that is accomplished. Well, thank you so much. Um, we will, if there are any questions that we didn't answer, again, we will follow up with you directly via email. Thank you everyone for joining us. Before you go, um, we do wanna make sure that we get your feedback. We want to continue to offer you quality webinars like this one. We will be giving away five copies of Dee's book, Demarginalizing Design. Um, it, so make sure that you complete the feedback form to qualify the win. Um, we are going to share that form now in the chat. Um, it'll also pop up at the end of the webinar and be in the follow-up email. And winners will be notified via email following the session. So we're going to drop that in the chat. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Dee, for sharing all these amazing tips for designing um, educational learning experiences that are student-focused, that focus on problem-solving and creativity. Um, that was awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you again here at Seesaw. Thank you all. Bye-bye.